Hello and welcome to this week's Sunday sit down video. I'm Jamie from Stillmeyer Games, and today's topic is turn order how different games implement turn order in terms of how players take their turns in the game. This idea was suggested by Sam Ives a while ago in the comments, or maybe in a message to me, I can't remember, but I made a note of the name. Sam, thank you for this idea. And Sam had some great thoughts on it, and I've kind of added to this list over time, and I thought it was time to talk about it. Um, yeah, so let's just, let's jump into it. Uh, I just have a, you can't see it, it's off camera here. I have a big pile of games of examples I'm going to use for this. I don't even know where to start. Uh, today's video won't be particularly organized. Let's start with one that I played recently, um, Aeon's End. I just finished playing the Aeon's End Legacy campaign. In Aeon's End, uh, the turn order is done in a really interesting way. I think it was actually my, all my favorite mechanism video. Um, it's a cooperative game, and in this game you need turns for the players and for the nemesis, the bad guy. What the game does, and I played a four-player game, I can't really speak to a, a smaller player count, but each player um, or actually each pair of players had a card associated with that pair. So uh, there was a card that had red and yellow on it, um, and there were two of those. And there were, card there were two cards that had blue and green on it, and there were two Nemesis cards. And every round of the game, you shuffle up those cards, and, uh, and you, you draw one. And if it's a Nemesis, the Nemesis takes a turn. If it's, say, the green-blue card, then the green and blue players, or the other players, decide if it's going to be the green player's turn or the blue player's turn. And then uh, you do the same thing. Like, on the next time the blue-green card comes up, it is, it is automatically the other player's turn. If you've already had a blue player turn, you can't take another blue player turn in the same round. Um, same with the, uh, the red and yellow players. And this mechanism added just a lot of interesting decisions to the game. I, I was surprised by how much it added without being like an overbearing decision that we, or discussion that we were caught up in. Um, but for a cooperative game, I thought it, it, it just made it really interesting to keep it keep this mix of, uh, of deciding like what's the best timing. If red and yellow comes up now, is it better for red to take a turn, better for yellow to take a turn, depending on what we have, depending on what the nemesis has. And it also creates some interesting uh, situations where uh, the nemesis might have could potentially have four turns back to back if they take the final two turns of a round and the first two rounds, two turns in the next round, which creates some tough situations, but uh, also creates some situations where maybe the nemesis goes first early in the round and then you have a bunch of turns where you don't have to deal with a nemesis for a while. That can be cool too. But that uncertainty of when it will happen, I thought that was really, really cool in uh, Aeon Zen Legacy. And I think the standard game has very similar rules. Uh, Let's, uh, I'll look at one of uh, Sam's examples here, because Sam, uh, he mentioned Brass, which I don't have on my shelf right now. Um, he mentioned that, again, kind of like an ANZ legacy, this is a good segue, you can spend the least and go last to first and effectively go twice in a row. Uh, so yeah, that, that's another thing, kind of like with the Nemesis in ANZ legacy, which is out of your control. In Brass, you actually do have some semblance of control over your turn order based on how much you spent that round, how much money you spent. And so uh, you can you can manipulate the turn order in in brass so that you can get two turns back to back or or kind of uh, not prioritize turn order and spend a lot of money and and go go last the, the following round. So I, I like that idea in brass that you can manipulate it a little bit. Let's talk about fire in the library, which actually combines two different turn order mechanisms. One is related to your victory points. So at the end of every round, you look at your victory points and the uh, the player with the fewest points decides the turn order in which they will go next. Let's see if I can dig out some cards here. Yeah, here are some of the cards here. So these are the actual turn order cards, um, first, first, fourth, third, and so on. And as you can see, these are different. Like th this is a push your luck game where you're trying not to burn down a library and uh, trying to get points competitively as you do this. And so you can see how these cards are all different. So that so it has two things. One is the the Victory points decides which player gets to decide their turn order for the next round, and then, um, and then you have these turn order cards that you that you select based on that order, and then you enact your turns in that order. Uh, so this is an interesting method, I think, for games to use. Uh, both of those things really to have turn order dictated a little bit by victory points. To if if turn order matters, then that could be a nice organic catch up mechanism for a game that has different rounds, and uh, and the idea of having turn order cards that you can select, whether you're drafting them or you're, you're selecting them at some point uh, during the round or at the end of the round. I think that can be a neat uh, mechanism as well that Fire in the Library does well. Let's 
fire in the library. Uh, another one that Sam mentioned, what, uh, he mentions Agricola and Kalis in the same category. He says, you can effectively pay a worker to move up in the turn order. Yeah, so this is, I like this example. So there are a lot of games where you, um, again, uh, wor usually worker placement games with rounds, where you can use an action to gain the first player token. So if you decide, okay, I, I really need to have the first player token, I, I need to have priority in the following round, um, that you can use an action to get it. And usually I think games that do that, Agricola, Kalis, Lords of Waterdeep does it. Uh, yeah, those are the good examples right now. Um, they they give you something else along with the turn order marker because the getting the turn order marker or the first player marker doesn't actually give you an advantage right away. And so it tries to, usually those games give you something now and you get the turn order um, token for later. So I think that's a good good way to do it in those types of games. And usually those games tend to fall into the category, which is kind of the easiest category for um, turn order, which is clockwise play. And the example I have for that, uh, I choose for many games in this category, but Rogers of the Ganges is one of my favorites, and it uses clockwise play. I take a turn, you take a turn, you take a turn, you, you take a turn, and so on. Uh, Rogers does have the ability to gain that first player marker uh, for the next round. I'm talking about a lot of games with rounds so far. Hopefully I have some examples that don't have rounds. Um, but I will say that early in my game design career, I didn't see the value in, uh, or I, I didn't admire the idea of having clockwise turn order because I didn't want, um, I thought it was kind of, uh, this is going to sound terrible, but I thought it was lazy design that you would have uh, players taking turns in that way because it's just kind of random who you sit down next to and your turn order is never changing. Um, and so you could, in games, there are some games where you are really affected by the players on your left and your right. However, I have since realized that I was very short-sighted in thinking that because I think there is actually a huge amount of value in having clockwise play. And the reason for that is that it doesn't require a game manager to kind of remind everyone whose turn it is. Uh, there are other examples that I will mention here that uh, where that is required. Uh, in fact, Aeon's End, while it's a cool thing to do, it does require someone to actually be the one that flip the cards every time. It requires someone to manage that aspect of the game. Um, same with Fire in the Library. I, I'm sure you've had this and happen, happen with games where you're like, okay, whose turn is it? Uh, maybe you've been sitting there for like 15 seconds waiting for someone to take a turn because I thought it was my turn. You thought it was, it was your turn. In clockwise play, I think that happens a lot less uh, because it's you always know. You, it's all, you don't re really have to be actively thinking about it. Okay, if the player to my right is taking a turn, obviously my turn is the next turn. So a counterexample to this, let's see if I have it. Yeah, I have it near the top of the pile is the first game that I designed and published, which is Viticulture, which does not use that method because at the time I thought it was a bad idea to have a uh, clockwise turn order. So Viticulture does two things. One is it uses a, uh, a turn order track inspired by Fresco, which is um, it's kind of a wake up track. You're determining when your workers are going to wake up. And so that's part of the game. At some point in the game, uh, throughout the game, you decide, okay, this round or this year, I'm gonna decide when my workers are going to wake up every day and other players do the same thing and you can't choose the same level of the track of that uh, that wake up track track and then throughout the rest of that year or that round that is the player order um the good side of this is it does it changes that player order quite a bit in both fresco and viticulture it has an interesting choice because you get uh, the later you go, the better the bonus you get from your player order. In Tuscany, I take it a step further in that every time you pass to a new season, you get a new thing. And so there are a lot of different bonuses that you can get from the different player order levels. It's a really interesting choice in the game. The downside, though, as compared to a game like Rogers of the Ganges, is that in Viticulture, um, you, it, it's very common to kind of forget whose who's turn it is or when your turn is. Uh, it, it's very clear on the chart, on the wake up track, but uh, you do you need someone to like constantly be running everyone. Okay, blue took a turn. Yellow, it's your turn. Green, it's your turn now. Red, it's your turn. Or there's, there's no red in viticulture. Um, so that, that is the downside to using a wake up track like that. The other weird thing that viticulture does is, at least in the core game of viticulture, uh, there is a uh, first player token uh, to determine who chooses their wake up time first every year. And that token passes counterclockwise, not clockwise. Uh, we did that so that uh, 
you kind of spread out the advantage of choosing who goes first over the course of the game. So like early on in the game, the first player has a little bit of an advantage, but then they slowly lose that advantage over the course of the game. And they, they may not ever end up having that first player token again, depending on the player count. Let's talk about uh, some uh, some games that don't use that use turn order in a very different way, which is um, more simultaneous decisions. So one example of this is Ink and Gold. In Ink and Gold, uh, players are deciding whether or not they want to stay in the cave or the dungeon, and they decide this simultaneously. And it's important that's a simultaneous decision because you are uh, if you're running out of the cave, then you're collecting treasure that has accumulated that no one has collected so far while you've uh, moved down into the cave or the dungeon. Um, and so you kind of want to be the only player to run out of the dungeon. At the same time, uh, you are deciding how to... De every, as you reveal new cards, you're, you are deciding, do I want to stay in longer and, and get more treasure? Um, and the more players who stay in, the more players you have to split that treasure with. So it's, it's a simultaneous decision. You're, you're kind of... we. There are different ways to do it, but in, in this version of the game, there's a little meeple that you hold in your hand and you reveal it at the same time, uh, or you drop it on the table to signal if you were staying in or not. So I, I think this is an interesting method. There are really no turns in Ink and Gold. You are just deciding, um, there's no play order at all. You're just deciding simultaneously if you're going to stay in the game or not. Another game that uses simultaneous uh, action selection in a different way is uh, The Reckoners. The Reckoners is a simult it's a cooperative game. I'll hold it for a second. And it is a uh, for most of the decisions you're taking in the game are just purely simultaneous. It's uh, players are just doing different things at the same time. Um, Spirit Island does this as well. And I know the uh, the guys at uh, the Co-op Cast, a, a podcast that specializes in discussing cooperative games, they really like this method of of cooperative play of having simultaneous actions. Um, it it create it does a few different things. One is it uh, cuts down on uh, like the alpha player, the quarterbacking in the game in a cooperative game because everyone's kind of just doing their same thing at the same time. There's no focus on one particular player at any given time. Um, you're kind of just you're you're organizing stuff. Number two, it feels very thematic. Like you're not you aren't using an artificial construct of turns. You were just doing stuff. Uh, throughout the, the the different cities the and with the different bad guys that come out in the reckoners um same with spirit island um although there there are parts of spirit island that are that are ordered um and what was the last part about this oh and it, it cuts down on on the playing time of the game because you're all doing stuff at the same time you're discussing it organically you're you're just doing things as you go so i think for cooperative games for the right cooperative games i think this type of simultaneous play can be really good i think the key though is that uh, the things that you're doing are very visible like there can't really be any hidden information in, uh, in, in a simultaneous play game. You kind of just have open information that you are sharing with all the players and interacting with that in that shared space with the other players. I think that can work really well for simultaneous play. Let's see if Sam has any other examples. Uh, he mentions power grid, um, where turn order, turn order might be first to last and then last to first in the same round. Yeah, power grid has a, a, an auction mechanism that goes one way and then a... Uh, the, the uh, choice that when you put cities on the board or, or yeah, as, as you build your power grid on the board, that goes the other way, I think, depending on maybe the number of cities that you have. It's been a while since I played power grid, but uh, power grid does have a, a very structured mechanism that's tied to the auction um, and tied to your current board state. Power grid kind of goes out of its way to rubber band the leader um, as part of this, which I think is a good idea, games of Power Grid typically end up being pretty close. Uh, but it can also be a little confusing to explain Power Grid because of because the turn order can go two ways every round, or it does go two ways every round. Um, let's do Scotland Yard. This is another one. That's kind of like the Reckoners, but this is one versus many. In Scotland Yard, uh, at least the the rules in this version, they may have changed over time. Uh, you have one player who is writing down where they are secretly moving on the board. That's Mr. X, Mr. and Mrs. X. You don't know where they're going. The other players are cooperating to find Mr. X, and they each do get a turn. But in Scotland Yard, they kind of they choose their own turn order. They You just say, okay, I'm going to go here, and once you move your token, you, you can't move again. You're done. You can't undo it. Um, 
but I kind of like I. I don't, I don't honestly know if that's even the official way to play Scotland Yard, but I really like doing that instead of taking turns in order because it doesn't really matter in Scotland Yard the order in which you go in, um, and it kind of speeds things along. Like, I'm, I am a little bit of an impatient player in cooperative games where maybe we get bogged down a little bit too much in the discussion of what we should do, and I like the ability to just do my turn, to take it. Um, and once I've taken it, that's it. That, that I cannot undo it, can't take it back, and no one else can stop me from taking it. Um, so rather than in a game like this where the discussion has the potential to bog down play and to slow down play, uh, instead of requiring you to wait for another player to take their turn, you can just do it. I really like that in Scotland Yard. Um, another game actually that has something very similar but is fully cooperative is The Seventh Continent, which is really interesting because Seventh Continent really has no turn order mechanism at all. Players just take turns. Uh, they, they, just, they just do stuff. They just take actions, basically. Um, and it's kind of up to the players in Seventh Continent to make sure that everyone is participating. It is possible to play a game in Seventh Continent where you don't do anything, where your character never does anything. Um, that does not happen when you actually play Seventh Continent, but it is possible. Um, the, the upside to this is that it feels very organic and natural. Like you are fully immersed in the theme of Seventh Continent as you're playing. There are no rounds to break up the structure of the game. You just, you, you just do stuff. You just take actions. You just move around. You explore stuff. You craft stuff. Um, and uh, you don't, it's, it's, it's almost hard to describe because it, you, it's, it's so far out of the normal construct of board games. Um, because really, I mean, I, I could say, okay, I'm going to craft this thing, and then I kind of want to do this other thing, I want to do this other thing. It's up to the players to actually uh, work together and to decide who's going to do what when and, and, and actually go ahead and just do it. Like I mentioned, Scotland Yard, you can just do stuff if you want to in Seventh Continent. Uh, it's a very, very interesting method. I think that's um, probably tied to the success of the game, that, that organic nature of, um, of when players take turns. And also in certain groups where maybe groups can really struggle with that if you want you can still take turns around the table like it is completely up to you when you take turns and how you take turns and how many things you do in a row let's talk about time tracks i know i have a whole video on time tracks but that's a definitely another great turn order mechanism i have two examples um one is patchwork um and the other is australia so the idea in these games for time tracks is that um, you're using time as a resource that you spend on certain things throughout the game. And actually, that's, that's the case in Australia. In Australia, you are using time as a resource. And if you have used the fewest time, the player who's taken the fewest time, it is their turn. It is always their turn uh, until they move, they jump ahead on the time track. Tokaido does this too. Um, I have a whole video about things. Heaven and Ale does it. And this is a, I, I really actually like this method for turn order because it's very visual. You can definitely see whose turn it is. It requires that game manager element a little bit, but but not too much because it it's so visual to see whose turn it is. And it implements an interesting decision. You, can, you have a lot of control over um, when your next turn will happen um, due to your, the choices you make in terms of how much time you spend in the game. Um, Patchwork does something fairly similar. And that you're spending you're spending time. Uh, it's not that you're spending time. You are, um, I guess you're essentially spending time. But you're gaining these tiles that have a time uh, on them. The time that it takes to put that patch into your quilt, and uh, th so that the token that you pick up requires you to spend time. You're not actually spending it, but it it, it makes you expend time, and that moves you forward on a time track. And uh, that determines the player order as well. But it's just a two-player game. So again, it's very easy to see whose turn it is on that, on that uh, time track. What else? Uh, one that I don't have on my shelf right now is Clans of Caledonia, which I really like the passing mechanism in Clans of Caledonia. Uh, because it's, it's a major choice in the game. Uh, when you choose to pass, you are not only choosing your player order for the next round, but you are also getting a significant bonus for passing. You are getting either a lot of money for passing first or not a lot of money for passing last. And so I really like this decision, this, is, this decision, especially in a game where money is very tight, like in Clans of Caledonia. Money is very important. I wouldn't say it's tight. There's a lot, of, you can get a lot of money, but it is, it's, a, it's an important resource to have. Um, 
And so I really like that decision in the game of deciding exactly when is the right moment to pass. Uh, and the Clans of Caledonia, I think, works really well in that respect. Another one that is related to that, and it was actually the inspiration for Clans of Caledonia, is Terra Mystica. So in the base game of Terra Mystica, this mechanism doesn't exist. Well, it uses a different version of this mechanism. When you pass into a Mystica, you get rid of your, uh, your you get this bonus tile every round. You get rid of the one that you have, and you select one of the three remaining bonus tiles that are on the table. And so, um, while I wouldn't say it's a huge part of the strategy, of your, well, it, actually, it, it can be. There, there are times in the game where you need a specific thing and you can't get it from the board, but the tile is available out there, and so you might decide when you choose to pass based on the tiles that you pick up, that little bonus that you pick up. Generally, though, in Terra Mystica, you pass when you no longer have the resources to spend. So players just take turns every round over and over again until uh, you, have no, you, have, you can't do anything else that round. Um, I think in games that have income... I like Terra Mystica, that's generally pretty important. You, you generally want to take as many turns as possible because you are increasing your income for the next round. However, in the expansion for Terra Mystica, I think there were maybe some complaints that the designers thought they could do something better. And so they implemented uh, this turn track here that's a little bit like the turn track in Viticulture and Fresco. Basically, you randomize these, uh, you have these little tiles that represent each of the five races in the game, in any particular game, or five-player game. You randomize them, and then uh, when I pass, I move my little token over here. So say I'm like, I'm going third this round, and I pass first, I move it to the first slot. And so this is a nice visual way of showing the turn order for the current round, and it also shows visually who has passed for that round. I think both of those things are accomplished really well visually. I think that's a good reminder. If you do have um, turn order that isn't clockwise, I think that visual, uh, some visual way of showing players whose turn it is or the turn order is really, really helpful. Um, overall, I really like this mechanism, except for the one issue, again, that I mentioned with Viticulture. You do need a little bit of a game manager to say, okay, uh, you know, the Chaos Magicians just went. Now it's time for the Ice Maidens to go. Now it's time for so on to go. I have a few more examples here. I think just two more examples. Yeah, actually, just one. Um, wait, let me see if I missed anything. Uh, yeah, it's just this one. Uh, this is... Uh, Games, it's another version of simultaneous play, basically. Um, drafting games, where all players are taking a turn at the same time, but they're doing their own private thing. Um, so an, an example of that is our lovely game Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig, which is a drafting game. And so all players are making part of the choices each round simultaneously and privately. Uh, I think this is a really nice way. The, the huge bonus with this is that... Uh, it scales really well. So between two castles, Madkin Ludwig plays from three to seven players. It also has a two-player variant in the box. And it just it scales super, super well uh, in terms of playing time because uh, no matter the number of players, the game is going to last pretty much the same amount of time. Um, the one downside for simultaneous play is that if you have a player who really struggles with analysis paralysis, they can slow down the game for everyone. Like everyone can have made their choice and they're just waiting. Like, there's nothing else you can do. You are just waiting for that other player. The other example of this is uh, of a different type of simultaneous play, but somewhat related, is On Tour. In On Tour, there's a roll and write game similar to Welcome 2 in that uh, a player, like it doesn't really matter who, who, which player it is. They roll dice and they reveal some cards. Completely random. Um, and then players simultaneously write down two numbers on their uh, on their player mat, and they do it completely simultaneously. So, and it's for this reason that Welcome to and On Tour scale infinitely, because uh, because it is simultaneously because the player uh, because there is no there's a random thing happening in the middle of the table, and then all all players make the same decision simultaneously. Uh, and they do it on sheets of paper or in on tour on, on these nice player mats, which lets you scale up the game simul uh, as, as much as you want. So I, I really like that element of simultaneous play as well, that uh, even though there isn't interaction between the players in on tour, there's pretty much no interaction. And welcome to there is there is a little bit of interaction, um, but I like that it scales so well due to that simultaneous play. 
I think that's it. I, I'm sure there are many games and examples that I miss, but that's what you are for. If you have thoughts and examples about uh, things that you like about turn order, things that you dislike, um, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments about, about these different turn order mechanisms. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you for joining me for this week's Sunday sit down, and I will see you on Tuesday for a My Favorite Game Mechanism video. Take care.